there are a couple of people already logged in.
Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Sir. Good afternoon. Good. Hi, I'm Gnaneshwar. Um, I'll be uh, taking this workshop um, where I'll be focusing mainly on certain aspects of uh, genome editing or popularly called as genome engineering using CRISPR. I'll, um, I'll be taking this module um, using three uh, sessions in each uh, class. Basically, I'll be doing an orientation, uh, revision, or uh, uh, boot camps of concepts, and then interaction. Boot, boot camps should cover um, everything based, um, ranging from uh, um, you know, uh, introduction to methods, to discoveries, and um, even um, any um, you know, uh, question and answers that you might have. And interaction um, would include, um, you know, question and answers as well as some assignments, um, simple assignments that we could probably do together. Um, do you all know who these ladies are? Uh, you could just answer me. Yeah. Jennifer Dodna and Emmanuel Charpentier. That's right. Um, that's very good to know that uh, most of you are already familiar with these um, scientists who discovered a novel gene editing tool known as CRISPR, um, about which we'll be uh, talking for many days to come from now. Uh, so in, in simple words, all we could say is that the discovery changes the world for good in many years to come. Um, you all would be familiar with uh, what engineers do and um, you know the sort of tools they would use um, to engineer stuff, uh, build things, as you can see on the left uh, side of this slide. On the other hand, what genetic engineers do is something similar. Uh, we um, engineer the genes and these genes have the codes on chromosomes um, inside the nucleus in which our DNA is present. Our DNA is present as um, you know, a basis of adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine, which are held together by sugar molecules uh, bound to each other by the phosphodeoxyribose backbone. And these two different strands of DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds. Uh, this is the language of DNA. This is how the DNA looks with alternating or uh, sometimes recurring repeats of these four nucleic acids, adenine, A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cytosine, which you might have studied in your um, you know, college and school curriculum. So this code, the way it repeats, um, determines how and what genes are produced and what happens to the cell, how a cell is made, how a cell becomes diseased, and how every component of the cell functions, because this holds the key, the code for the cell, and thus when cells come together, it forms an animal to which all the credit goes to DNA. Uh, this DNA, this um, you know, molecule DNA is present in all the living organisms um, as humans, uh, other animals, plants, 
um, simple uh, single cellular organisms like bacteria and uh, others. Like I said, the genes give us traits, basically how we look, how we are made, how we function. And these traits could be good or bad, which determines whether we are healthy or we have a disease. And when you can appreciate and learn how to be healthy and what composes a healthy gene system, you can use it in discovering treatments and then applying it to cure diseases. And genes can also be influenced by environment, which plays a role in how we function. For instance, this rabbit, this Himalayan rabbit, when it grows at 20 degrees temperature, it has these pigments, but when you just increase the temperature to about 30 degrees, these pigments go off. So meaning to show that environment plays a huge role in, uh, in how the gene function is shaped. So um, in simple words, there is always a fine balance between our development, normal development and health, and whether we catch a disease or not, which is mainly um, determined by genes which act on this seesaw uh, like balance, which can be intervened and meddled with to tweak this balance from disease and treatment to development and health by using certain interventions like environment, which you uh, saw in this slide, or certain technologies. So these two ladies discovered the CRISPR-Cas9 for which they were awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. And these, before their discovery, there is a long way back uh, from Mendelian genetics who determined that we possess some inherent properties which we get from our mother and father where there is uh, a mixing happening in the offspring which determines what sort of offspring we get. And this was attributed to DNA whose double helix was discovered by these two people, James Watson and Francis Crick. Uh, we know a lot of uh, achievements by these two men here. Um, I would just like to ask you if you know who this lady is in this image. Rosalind Franklin. Yes, absolutely. It is her work where she used X ray diffraction um, to look at the DNA structure that these scientists used. Uh, for their prized discovery. However, uh, you know, uh, her contribution was missed out for most part of, um, you know, the science behind DNA and uh, contributions. Uh, she was missed on the mentions. Um, but it's true that her contribution made this discovery possible. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, we are going to be talking about engineering the genes using appropriate tools. And CRISPR is just a tool. But even before CRISPRs, and we humans engineered these CRISPRs, there, there is engineering of genes happening in the nature. So my question is, are we humans alone capable of engineering the genes? No, if we look at evolution, which is nature's own genetic engineering tool from the beginning of life on earth for us to move on from our primate ancestors to become humans who have now 
um, you know, started going back to the DNA of these species and working on them to us having have evolved for millions of years, this nature's own genetic engineering tool in the form of evolution is responsible. And if we look at bacteria, which has a lifetime of uh, you know, several minutes to hours, they can become resistant to many drugs or antibiotics in a lab condition or any other conditions that you expose them to through evolution of their genome where they code for antibiotic resistant genes. And this evolution is responsible for their survival. So evolution, even before we observed and noticed that there are certain components in our genes that can be edited, evolution had, had it running in the background. And thousands of years before, even we uh, even before we discovered DNA or its structure or anything led to such assumptions that there could be something called DNA in our body, which determines how we look, how organisms look and function around us. We had selective breeding that was in practice in agriculture and animal husbandry for thousands of years. For instance, this plant, this, this mustard plant, this wild mustard plant, was selectively bred in different parts of the world to get different traits in their offsprings. And we have cabbage out of it now, growing as um, a plant. We have Brazil's sprout, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and our uh, most revered food, cauliflower. So these are all products of selective breeding, hidden genetic selection as a tool that was being engineered by our ancestors without even understanding uh, how they are playing with the DNA of these organisms. And we now have exploited this to get good breeds of cows that can generate, um, that can produce milk in large quantities. We have pets that have been selectively bred for uh, any preferred trait from being wild in temper to growing huge to furry, to very cuddly, to ferocious and very cute looking pets. So these are all a result of selective breeding through, uh, through several centuries. And most recently, uh, I'm sure you all might have been reading a lot about coronavirus, how it has impacted and out of curiosity or um, by specialization, you might have come across how coronavirus has evolved from other coronavirus species which had been infecting bats and other wild animals. So their genome evolved to infect humans at this ACE2 receptor on our cells. So this ACE2 receptor has a specific human sequence which now this coronavirus, because of its evolution, recognizes on its spike protein and this gets embedded in our cell, gets taken up, gets taken up by our cells where they uh, rep replicate and affect us. And if you read the literature, you'll find that 8% of human genome is said to be made from virus genome. And this is not just from since our birth alone. This composes all those viral genes that our ancestors have uh, faced and survived and transferred into our system. And we do not yet know what, what are these virus genomes doing inside human genome that has been passed down to us from our parents. And even in the case of this coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, it has been recently shown that it too, this virus genome can also integrate into human genome where they show these 
um, sequences, the green sequences from the human genome, where they found this magenta um, alphabets of coronavirus sequence, which has been published, uh, which has not been published yet, but uh, available in internet, published by this group, um, which is being discussed for the validity of this work right now. This was just published in December. You can read this for um, your reference. So meaning that genome engineering is not something that we invented, but we just discovered that it indeed exists, just like how we, you know, look at nature, enjoy, appreciate, and use it to our advantage to build forts, dams across rivers, just by carefully observing the topology, how the nature is in a certain place by appreciating, um, borrowing ideas, and we build marvels. In the same way, in the lab, we all um, who are doing science observe these tiny creatures, be it viruses, bacteria, or our own cells, and learn how, how these tiny molecules function inside the cells, how they affect us, and we use these ideas borrowed from these molecules for our advantage using advanced tools to edit the genome. So this is what these ladies did. They discovered CRISPR and for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize. But why is this such, such an important discovery? To understand this, it is important to appreciate how this process works. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regulatory Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats. In a nutshell, these are repeats of DNA between which is embedded the gene from the invading virus. And this was discovered in a bacteria known as Streptococcus pyrogenes. So these viruses that infect the bacteria are called bacteriophages. And what they do is just like how they affect our cells by pushing their DNA or RNA into our cell, they affect other bacteria in a similar way by pushing in their DNA or RNA and what happens in these bacteria is that in order to defend themselves, just like how we defend using our immunity against viruses or bacteria, bacteria too have their own immune system where they rely on stealing the information from these viruses and using it against them. How they do it is they incorporate these viral genes in between this clustered regulatory, uh, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, they put in the viral DNA and this is transcribed by, um, the, uh, by the RNA polymerases to form precursor CRISPR RNA, which binds to Cas9 this Cas9 is an enzyme that cuts the DNA if this RNA recognizes the same virus genome. So the bacteria is using the virus genome by incorporating it, making RNA out of it, packing it with an enzyme that cuts any DNA that this complex binds to. And this complex can only bind to the same DNA that came in through this virus. So this is how the bacteria defend themselves against invading viruses. And for making this discovery, these uh, women received the Nobel Prize. So this is how 
the gene, the DNA editing works in a nutshell. You have the nucleus um, inside which there are chromosomes and the DNA in these chromosomes is being recognized by the guide RNA and the guide RNA uses a DNA cutting enzyme such as Cas9 and cuts the DNA, which is now repaired with faults or with specific uh, replacement of our desired strand of interest. And the DNA, when it replicates, is now edited. So to understand these things in detail, I would like to just show you an example. So I'm pretty sure that all of you use this word processor um, where you write your documents, your assignments. Let's say this is the genetic code. There is, there is a region of interest which we will call it CAT and we want to replace this sequence here with our own code. What do we do in a word processor? We find the sequence CAT, which is present in so many places, as you can notice. And if you instruct CAT to be replaced with ATG, you get ATG in place of CAT. As you can now see, all the places with CAT is replaced by ATG. CRISPR works in our cells to do exactly the same trick that I just used the word editing tool using find and replace. Basically, we are finding our region of interest in the DNA using a guide molecule. We are cutting it out with the DNA cutting enzymes and we use our own uh, cell repair, DNA repair system, uh, either homologous end joining or, uh, or non-homologous end joining to edit the gene. So here we will talk about how, how useful this technique is in editing the genes in the cells to making animals with such to making animals with such cells that have genes edited in them to begin with we need to understand how the development happens in these animals for instance In humans, when the embryo is fertilized, one cell, one cell becomes two cell, and then, and then the cell division keeps repeating where there is an initial cell mass, which are the stem cells that become any cell of our body through specialization where they go through several genetic program and then these specialized cells become more and more specialized to become target tissues, organs, and then a full, fully developed 
human fetus as I show here. Similarly, animals also have something similar where this is a zebra fish embryonic development, which happens quicker than humans. We humans take nine months to grow. Oops, let me just. Just give me a minute. It's taking a while to load, but it would have been interesting if this video had loaded where the zebra fish development is so quick. Okay, good, it opened. So here, Here we can observe a zebra fish development happening from one cell to two cell and then so on. The development is so rapid that, um, you know, from a single cell to two cell and further up till uh, an animal pole is formed and a complete animal is formed. It takes just 24 hours. It is very important to appreciate these cellular processes happening at different time scales um, in different organisms. And such quick development can be used to our advantage where we can use these as model systems to study how um, gene editing works or uh, to understand the function of any genes that influences the development of these animals from which we can take a cue and understand how human development is happening. Okay. is distracting me, just a minute. And now, okay, we were right here. So what happens in this development of single celled eggs to an animal is the sperm from male mixes with the eggs from the female, as we all know. And then this gives rise to a fertilization process where this development from single cell to multiple cell and then multiple cells specializing to form organs like head, eye, hands, and then the complete body happens. And then we again get, I'm sorry. Uh, could you just give me, hello? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, could you just give me a second? Thank you. Could you just give me a second? I'll connect my laptop to a power source. It's going to go off. Okay, sir.
Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Sorry, I lost connection in the meanwhile. Yes, sir. You are audible. Thank you. So we were here discussing about um, single cells, how they become capable of growing into uh, an animal and how a complete animal is formed. In this transition, these cells, the sperm, the egg, and the fertilized um, egg make up the germ cells. And once the fertilized has happened and cell division starts, it makes up the somatic cells from which an animal is born. So these cells that become different target tissues like eyes, head, hands, heart, lungs, and all these end products of all these um, multiple cell divisions and um, you know cell um, and tissue development program, the end target cells are called somatic cells. And these somatic cells make up how the animal looks. And then again, the germ cells, which contribute to making of um, another animal in the form of uh, fertilizing the egg um, using the sperms is called the germ cells. So we have have two kinds of germ cells. Excuse me for the noise. I'll just unmute, uh, mute for a while and then unmute back again. Okay, sir. So, I was saying that there are two types of germ cells, eggs and sperm cells, and their mixture gives rise to fertilization process that um, gives rise to many somatic cells that become different parts of our body. And then the whole body is made of several different kind of somatic cells. So basically animal development is a journey from germ cells to somatic cells that become different tissues and organs. And in this process, we have stem cells, which are, which are intermediates and early intermediates, um, which have the capacity to become any target cell types. They could, so these two, cells here in the zygotic stage, these two cells after their division are part of the stem cell population, which can become any cell of our body. They have the potential to become any cell of the body. If you get these cells and use genome editing on it, it would help to correct or rectify defects in the whole animal or if you have this genome editing at some stage specifically where that particular that particular population of cells are formed which become eyes if you want to correct eye defects if you want to correct defects in hands that particular population of cells which make the hands if they are edited at the right time we have the potential to correct any genetic defect. And these stem cells that are obtained from embryos, which can self-renew, are called as embryonic stem cells. They go through differentiation signals that I was talking about to form three different population of stem cells, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm layers of our body, which forms in the gastrula where ectoderm forms here, the mesoderm, and then the endoderm, all of which give rise to different population of cells that contribute to making different tissues in the body. 
and then we have somatic cells which differentiate to become a particular organ source or they can also differentiate to become somatic stem cells which can become any type of cell in the body later sir yes um, sir. Can you repeat the gastrula part? I did not understand what the gastrula is and what ectoderm everything. So at this stage, okay. So uh, you don't have to worry about um, this stage as such. It is just important to understand that this stage. At this stage, we have these three layers of. tissues forming these three layers of uh, these three cell layers forming in the egg in the gastrula stage which go on to become uh, ectoderm uh, ectodermal cells mesodermal cells and endodermal cells which i'll come to here so endoderm okay sir okay so endoderm becomes the basis of organs such as lung pancreas mesoderm becomes the basis of organs such as heart muscle red blood cell and ectoderm becomes the basis of our skin our neurons in the brain and so on these are just examples there are many more uh, other tissue and organs and cell types that have been left out here this is just for the sake of example and these these stem cells are of two categories one is totipotent embryonic stem cell and the other is pluripotent embryonic stem cell where there are these different stages of differentiation during growth when they differentiate they achieve a certain capacity for instance in totipotent stage of embryonic stem cell this can become even a placenta of the developing it can even become the placenta of the developing embryo and this capacity of forming that layer is only in the totipotent embryonic stem cell whereas the pluripotent uh, stem cell has the capacity to become any this pluripotent embryonic stem cell has the capacity to become any part of the body so you just have to choose the stage of editing the genes wisely so that you end up seeing the genetic changes in cell types that are your cell types of interest so coming to cellular contents i'm pretty sure this image or similar images might have repeated several times in your um study of biology right from your school to college and what is important to note here for us is this region called nucleus and nucleolus within which we have our dna which we are interested in um manipulating so we come to the second boot camp here where i'll be discussing about certain basic molecular biology concepts so like i said our dna in the chromosome is present as this chemical structure shown here with adenine thymine guanine cytosine standing for a t g and c repeating multiple times in our dna and this dna undergoes replication in the cell where there are several enzymes and components involved where they faithfully replicate the parent strand into daughter strands where there are two sister strands forming that complement each other and this requires several enzymes and enzymes with proofreading capacity to correct these mistakes 
using which they replicate and make more copies of our DNA during mitosis and meiosis to make more cells. Next is the step which we know as transcription, which involves formation of RNA from the DNA strand. So, uh, hello. Yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Okay, thank uh -huh. you. Good to know. It said my internet connection is unstable, so I was just checking. Okay. So, using this DNA, RNA is made uh, where RNA polymerases come into play to transcribe the DNA into mRNA. Uh, pardon me, this whole sequence changed when I did uh, show you an example of editing throughout my slide. I wasn't expecting this, but nonetheless, the RNA sequence has not changed. So I'll uh, don't be uh, you know puzzled to not see the cyto uh, the um, uh, the C in this sequence. Uh, so I was saying that DNA is transcribed into RNA using RNA polymerases, and then these mRNA specifically, which have the complementary strand of this DNA, meaning that if you have, so we all know that A can only bond with T and very uh, loosely with G or C and it is very unstable if it bonds with anything. So A forms a faithful bond with T and G forms the same uh, triple bond with C. That is used as a complementary code where A um, is used as a primer to attract uracil in the RNA, which is an alternative for uh, T, the thymine in the DNA, and then so on. Again, uh, T in the DNA will uh, invite A in the RNA, and then G invites C, and then so on. So here you have the start of your genetic code that codes for the protein, the AUG, as we all would have learned. So what happens is the ribosomes on which these mRNA is supposed to translate to make proteins scan for this AUG sequence and then dock the mRNA on themselves and then start translating the mRNA into proteins. Uh, we will not worry much about the downstream processes because we can keep on going through molecular biology lessons uh, endlessly. But what I find is relevant uh, for all this information uh, to be known for subsequent classes and um, all um, further um, you know, um, themes that we'll be discussing. So just to reiterate, protein, proteins are made on the ribosomes by using the mRNA and translating the genetic code now transcribed on mRNA into proteins. And these ribosomes are present outside the nucleolus on uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum which hosts these ribosomes, or these ribosomes could also be floating around inside uh, the cytoplasm freely, where the proteins are made. Now, these proteins go on to build these cells that are uh, maintaining, self-sustaining, and then they would also be dividing. So all this process requires more and more proteins to be made. And faithfully, all this code, all this code has to translate into mRNA, and then uh, I'm sorry, this has to transcribe into an mRNA, which has to now translate into a protein. And this is where the changes 
that we did in the gene editing process, the changes on these proteins pay its dividend into making the kind of cell we want and alterations on the cell compartments wherever we want. So this is the power of the gene editing, which I described. And just to reiterate, just to uh, revise and bring you all back onto the same page, we, we choose a region of interest in the chromosome um, where we have a DNA sequence that is targeted by this guide molecule, which is usually an RNA, which is called as the guide RNA. And this guide RNA binds to this target sequence and the enzyme that it brings along with it called the Cas9 cuts the DNA, which is now stitched back by the cell's own process, which is prone to errors if it doesn't have enough information to repair this strand. And this gives, uh, this, this gives the effect of deletion or with appropriate modifications, we can even insert the gene of our interest in this region or remove this gene completely out of the system. So, uh, so far, do you have any questions? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, is everything clear? Do you want me to repeat anything? No. Now is the time. No, sir. No, sir. It's clear. Okay. Okay, sure. All right. So, where do we do the gene editing? We have now set our mind that we need to edit some genes, um, but where do we start? What cells do we choose? Um, where is it ideal? for us to start so that we have the effect in all our cells or only some cells or certain regions of our body or should this change be passed on to the next generation through our germ cells. So this is right now germ cell, uh, germ line versus somatic gene editing which we will be discussing right now. So um, can you guys just tell me what is a germ cell and what is a somatic cell? Just to know if you guys germ have cells, the concept so far. Germ cells are uh, sperms and uh, the ovum and somatic cells mm -hmm. are these cells who specialize and then form other tissues. Oh, somatic cells are normal body cells, anything other than the germ cells. Good. And um, are stem cells somatic cells? Yes, so stem cells can be some, uh, so somatic cells as they can uh, like multiply and form any kind of other body cell. But how can they okay. be somatic? So they, stem cells are a different branch of cells, right? They are not somatic nor germline. Yes. Yes, uh, but there are also I'm somatic sem st uh, Hello, can I say something? Yes, sir. Go ahead. There are also somatic yes, uh, stem cells, which are present, which are present together with um, you know other uh, population of uh, somatic cells. They are present. They are pre present in. Uh, uh, the general population of these somatic somatic stem cells. Sir, your voice um, is lagging. Can you please repeat not... what you just said? Okay. Um, how about now? Am I audible clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was saying that. Hello. 
Hello. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Audible okay. Now. Go ahead. Uh, you guys were not audible for me for a while. Okay. Um, so, um, where were we? Yeah, we were uh, uh, discussing about uh, somatic cells, germ cells, and uh, stem cells. So, stem cells form at any stage of embryonic uh, development, and they keep replenishing themselves. And a certain pool gets uh, saved in different regions, especially the bone marrow, uh, which is capable of making um, self-renewing self stem cells to uh, make different tissues like skeletal muscle and um, um, blood cells and bone cells themselves. So um, these become the somatic stem cell population where the body has formed, but there is a certain pool of stem cells still in the body that are present together with other somatic cells. So these are usually referred to as somatic stem cells. And um, so which of these, um, you know, which of these cells would you prefer? Somatic germ cell or stem cells for gene editing? Stem cell? Germ cells, germ line. Uh, somatic cells, if we don't want uh, the edit to be passed on to our generations. Germ cells. Okay. Okay, seems like different people have different priorities. Uh, some people would want to edit at the germ line. Some people would want to edit the genes at somatic. And then some wants to do it in the stem cell. So each, I'm sure you would have chosen um, these cells for your editing um, based on some logic. Um, can you guys tell me who all suggested germ germline cells, why you want editing done in germline cells? So, so if we edit the germline cells, then the, uh, that, the edit that, that we have made can be transferred to the next generation so that we can create it uh, like a new, it so will be transferred to the next generation, so it will go on like that. So once yes. the germline cell is edited, uh, it mm -hmm. will whenever it's passed on or whenever from a germline cell another generation is made, it will have mm -hmm. the same characteristics as the previous generation. Hence, germline uh, cells are much better for genetic engineering. Good. Um, that's good to know, both of you, um, that you have a reason behind choosing germline cells. And how about people who chose somatic cells for editing the genes. Um, what's the basis there? What's the reason you chose, you chose somatic cells? Uh, so I'm sorry, can one person speak at a time? Um, Sir, only I'm speaking. Okay. Yeah, so, um, am I audible? I see a lot of people talking at the same time. Maybe, uh, maybe the back, it's the background noise. If people with background noise can, uh, yeah. So the reason for choosing somatic cells may be that uh, if you want to exper uh, experiment, for example, uh, uh, it is not transferable to next generation, right? So if there is a mistake yes. or if you want to experiment some characteristics or traits, then somatic cells can be used. And then the like results, what you want, and if you get the say, required results, yeah, expected results, you can do the same mm -hmm. gene editing with the germline gene, uh, cells, right? So we can do somatic uh, uh, gene editing also for like silencing some genes. Like if there's a disease, then we can uh, silence that particular genetic disease using that somatic uh, uh, genes, uh, somatic gene therapy. So it can be specific to a person. Okay. Okay. So there are reasons for choosing somatic uh, gene editing as well. Uh, how about people who prefer stem cell editing?
so Hello. so by, so uh, in stem cell editing we can edit a stem cell then we can uh, transfer the edited stem cell to any human in the world because at the stem cell it will produce the, the cells uh, uh, like it can produce any cell so uh, that is the advantage of stem cells i feel that we can produce a large number of stem cells and edit it at once and we can like sell it at, as a medication to various people mm-hmm. that's very nice to know Stem cells edited, like there will be compatibility problems and such. Hello. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Sir. So each of these choices have their own inherent advantages. Many of which you guys rightly mentioned. That if you, uh, so I'll just go over the same reasons that you guys gave. And um, you know, each experiment is unique. Each disease that you want to rectify is unique. Each condition is very unique. So it just depends on your. choice of uh, you know cells and the condition which you want to correct for so um before i begin about germ cells i would want to say that human germ line editing is still not legally allowed it's been tried by some chinese scientists um but it was without proper approvals and it faced a lot of criticism there are 40 countries in the world uh, who have the capability to do gene editing and they all have signed um, you know a a, tre- a kind of a treaty a medical treaty w- which prevents editing uh, even research um, they prevent even research where it is um, allowed to edit germ cells so right now uh, human germ line gene editing is is not worked upon uh, but nonetheless there are many animal models on which this is being carried out to understand um, what the effects are on the animal how much of these changes how much of these changes that we edit in these germ cells can be controlled in somatic cells do these changes affect non specifically or adversely affect the human or does it affect the genome as such because any editing any gene editing process requires meddling with dna and there are a lot of complications involved just in even a simple replication process where there are several components involved and if you edit something that goes out of control in any of these processes and if they are being if they are being used to make a population of animals or uh even in humans it could be problematic if we have no control later right now the debate is as to how much control do we have using gene editing tools in in the making of the whole animal and these animals propagating to make next generation because we don't want a population of animals or human beings which have adverse effects and um you know go through certain selection pressure pressures gene selection pressures which affect as adversely in let's say 10 20 100 years to come or even um you know a millennia so right now human germ line editing is not allowed and it is only being experimented in animals which all of which being done for many years and many more years should give us enough data to decide whether human gene editing at the germline level is to be allowed or not so it is right now in a lot of legal hurdles now coming to somatic gene therapy i appreciate 
in the same way people who chose cleverly um i'm not saying this is nonetheless not clever but it's just that uh it's stuck with a lot of uncertainties uh in the form of uh, regulatory processes or its effect later in future generations but what i was saying is uh people who chose to um uh, you know people who preferred somatic gene therapy uh had their own reason which was based on control where you can control and target <coughs> a certain region only a region of interest only Yeah, can you hear me? Am I audible? Uh, you are audible, but there is a lot of background noise. If you can control the background noise, go ahead, please. What is it? Hello. Okay. If you come back online, I'm available. So I was saying that somatic um, gene editing. has its own merits and demerits so you can the demerit the main demerit is it is only limited to certain cell types only specialized cell types you can't do a general somatic um gene editing for the whole animal just by targeting all the somatic cells if you want to do it you have to start from the embryo but if you have a certain condition which affects lungs uh, liver pancreas or uh, reproductive system or eyes brain such specific cell types when all of the other organs are functional and if you want to edit only a specific cell type you can go for somatic stem cell uh, i'm sorry stom- somatic uh, gene editing so um next people who chose um people who who chose stem cell gene editing uh, which is also wise um and much in demand uh, you know process which also has its own regulatory shackles um at each step where you have to get a lot of uh, regulatory approvals um and here you're right that if you alter the stem cell let's say at the totipotent stage at the totipotent stage or at the pluripotent stage you have the ability to induce the editing of genes in the whole animal or if you choose a a, a specific um differentiated uh, stem cell population like the ones that can become endoderm mesoderm or ectoderm if you choose the right population the target population for stem cell gene editing you will nonetheless correct the defects at your uh, target regions of interest using these specific stem cell gene editing uh, step so uh, is it clear yes sir yes sir okay okay so going back to this debate between germline and somatic cells it's all about control whether you have the gene editing process completely figured out um or you have some step i'm sorry did somebody ask something no sir okay good so so uh this distinction between germline and somatic gene editing is very important in um uh, in in the regulation process you just can't choose um you know human germline editing and i was telling you that this germline editing is only allowed in animals and where we need to gain enough knowledge as to what is happening to the whole population of animals um could could 
could the person uh, could everybody mute please i hear occasional background noises okay thank you so uh moving on to specifically germline gene editing i was saying that you edit or manipulate the embryos just like in vitro fertilization you collect the eggs and the sperm you mix them uh in a uh, dish to fertilize the egg uh, and then you micro inject your uh dna editing system by pinching through these eggs and then once this uh gene editing system is introduced into the egg these eggs are um you know cultured and then you you need to check whether the gene editing has happened uh in these cells and then use these at the blastocyst stage to transfer it into the embryo so this is embryonic gene editing and you could either choose to edit only in the oocyte only in the eggs of the female using the same process or you could do it in the sperms so here what you will be um, controlling is which are the genes so let's say a disease is known to be transmitted only through males a, gen a certain genetic disease that uh, only comes from the x chromosomes or if it is coming from the y chromosome you want to edit uh, those genes in either eggs or in the sperm and then use it for uh, in vitro fertilization and then transfer these blastocysts blastocysts to uh, the animal and then you expect to see gene changes that are inherited in the in their offspring uh it could be uh, plants or animals and then these these offsprings should be monitored for the same edited genes and if this particular gene that is edited does not pass on to their germ line you will not see it in these babies for instance we can take this plant this experiment being done in the plant um before i begin i would like to introduce the concept of mosaic uh, editing where you see three categories of editing here where the red is the edited cell here all of the cells are edited but here only some cells are edited the white is the unedited cell so this is what i am referring to as mosaic pattern if you do somatic gene editing you are prone to face a lot of these mosaic uh, gene editing processes wherein you will see some cells and not all cells are edited as you can see here in this plant tissue this is the watermelon plant where uh, some uh, pigment related gene was um, edited and you see this line 3 with a mix of white and green uh, pigments in this uh, plant here but here you have a pure albino and the same here as well this is a result of mosaic gene editing in line 3 where you see that this is the wild type so some of these have the wild type wild type alleles still present wild type cells still present and those are coming out as green cells but uh, the white cells there is gene editing as well but it is mosaic and then it 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 causes this albino mixed with some pigments as well but in the line 10 and line 14 these are all 
um, you know uh, these are all tissues with uh, uniform gene editing as you can see here there are missing uh, pieces of dna in these lines so it is very important to appreciate and acknowledge mosaic editing happens when you go for somatic when you go after somatic cells unlike germ cell or unlike stem cell you can't see a uniform effect across all population of cells even if you are targeting a certain region uh, a certain tissue specifically even within those uh, tissue cells some in the population may have gene editing and some may not and those that do not if they override this population you will not see uh, much effect of gene editing as is the case here where you see albino mixed with uh, the green uh, the mixed with cells that are um, producing this green pigment as well so this is one main disadvantage in somatic gene editing but also a similar mosaic patterns can be found immediately in in the first founder generation which was made where some cells of these animals might not have the same gene editing process happen throughout all the cell populations uniformly so they might have the genes edited only in some cells or uh, some of the cells may not have it so it is important to appreciate that mosaic editing happens and then it becomes important to screen for uniform population uniform population of cells that have same gene editing happening for instance let's say in this line 10 you want an allele with all these nucleotides missing all these bases missing you need to propagate these through several generations to acquire the same genetic change giving rise to a pure phenotype which is albino as in this case so uh, in somatic gene editing you edit um taking the target cell and um you know you edit its genes and then transplant it back where these uh, cells grow and it can happen the gene editing uh, can happen ex vivo uh, it's important to familiarize yourself with these terms such as ex vivo in vivo could somebody tell me what is ex vivo uh ex vivo means outside the body like uh, outside the uh, body uh, body and in vivo means inside inside the, the body. body yeah so you have the capacity to basically take these cells out from your target uh, system so let's say you have a patient with uh, a brain disease maybe alzheimers you want to find treatment using gene editing for alzheimers you take out these cells culture them in a dish and then you edit their genes and culture them to get a uniform population of these cells with the same gene edited and then you transplant them back into the patient and expect to correct for defects so this gene editing here was happening ex vivo but you could use appropriate vectors to target your gene editing tool into the cells without taking them out but right inject these gene editing tools right into the tissue and expect to see 
them propagate within the cells. Uh, can you think of such a gene editing tool? Can you think of any vector that um, you know that can be used as a system where which which propagates these gene editing tools in the cells? Talons, Could you do that? Talons like transcription activator like uh, effector nucleases or ZFN zinc finger nucleases. Okay, so those are basically tools, just like CRISPR. I meant a system, a stable system that can give rise to these uh, these uh, uh, changes for in vivo gene editing. Can you think of uh, so retroviruses? Bacteriophage vectors. Yes, yes, exactly. Viral vectors are an excellent choice to do. In vivo, yes, viral plasmids, viral vectors are uh, an excellent choice where you edit uh, the virus and um, inject it into target tissues where these viruses are supposed to replicate just like the coronavirus. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, just like um, you all might be on the same page with the replication of coronavirus that um, you know we are we, we are all familiar with so similar to that so similar to that use viral vectors to um, you know to carry our gene editing tool and infect the target cells which have which have affinity to their spike protein use them as vectors to carry the gene editing tools and then we can do gene editing in vivo by just injecting these viral vectors so that's an excellent answer and and yep so, yes, um, stem cell gene editing is the most preferred way where you can just uh, pick on any population of stem cell that can become, um, you know, any tissue type or organ in an animal. You could just take the stem cells out, edit the genes, and then put them back in the animal. So this is another, um, these are the three preferred modes of gene editing, germline gene editing, somatic gene editing, and stem cell gene editing, where you have to take care of the mosaic gene, uh, mosaic gene edits that happen, which will not be uniform across all cells, where different cells might have different uh, genetic changes. You so, need to, yes. So in uh, stem cell gene editing, that mosaic uh, mosaic editing would not be a problem, right? Because if we are using stem cells and if we are removing out and we are editing it, then we can just screen it, and then we will know that then the mosaic editing should not be a problem, right? Um, mosaic editing can still be a problem there because when you introduce these gene editing tools. Let's say now you have these many cells. You have these many cells that you want to edit the genes. And these are your target stem cells, let's say. Uh, what happens here is each, each cell might take up or might not take up the, the same gene editing tool. And within each cell, the edits will not be same. Some cells might have just, as you can see here and can appreciate, some cells might have just these two deletions and uh, some cells might have zero deletions because you know many things can happen in an experiment where you are just expecting
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, I was saying that. Okay. Um, oh. Let me fetch my slide. and um no problem just give me a second i'll pull my slide out So yeah, um, sorry for the trouble. Yes, so um, yes, here we were. I was saying that even in this population of cells that have gene editing. No, we can't see the slide. Sir, oh, really? not okay. Okay. Visible. Let me fix that. I thought it was shared. Okay. Can you see the slides now? Yeah. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Oh, it keeps. So I was saying that in, in a population of uh, cells that have gene editing successfully, you might still see that each cell has unique gene editing. Like in this case, line 10 on the difference between line three and line 10 is that some of the cells still have the wild type, the normal, uh, you know, gene for this pigment cells. And very few have uh, this uh, gene editing, the same gene editing. But whereas if you see that, although this has, um, you know, albino phenotype here with successful gene editing, each cell type, each cell type has different kinds of mutation. As you can see, it says here that it has eight nucleotides missing, and this just has one nucleotide missing. And this one has an addition of one of the nucleotides. These places have different genetic changes in different cells. So it means that it is still mosaic. The gene editing is still mosaic. Although the gene has been successfully edited, the changes are different in different cells. For absolute control over your experiment, it is very important that you have cells with same gene editing across all its populations, which you will reach by successfully isolating these cells and then uh, culturing them and then uh, subculturing them or these uh, plants and animals after uh, certain generations of breeding where you will find offsprings which have one kind of mutation or um, gene insertion or let's say gene correction. Um, so hope this concept is clear about mosaic editing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, sir yeah. may I ask oh. a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, I'm sure students are enjoying. Uh, I have a question related to mosaic editing. Um, okay. 
since uh, you can see that there are uh, you know each uh, line has a, a mosaic of uh, mm -hmm. you know editing is mm -hmm. it uh, possible to also uh, get the mutations induced which are undesirable and mm -hmm. uh, how to achieve specificity uh, with respect to this because it is in animals probably uh, uh, it would lead to a more undesirable changes especially if it is applicable for uh, humans so how to have control over specificity in mosaic editing uh, specificity in mosaic editing in simple words yes uh, how you achieve it yeah right. so um, so here i'm not talking about uh, you know specific gene editing that we are doing here so here i'm just talking about um, so in the coming classes i'll definitely talk about specificity that can be achieved in gene editing using modifications of the same crispr cas9 technique uh, right now i am talking about just the gene editing to create mutants where you have no control absolutely no control it is important to appreciate that you have no control in the beginning of this process but if you use modifications of the same crispr cas9 technique where if you have target regions which you can replace through homologous recombination you can achieve um, you can achieve specificity uh, i wanted to use this discussion tomorrow about uh, you know tomorrow's uh, class will be about um, you know uh, mutations their analysis how they occur um, in homologous manner and non homologous manner so i wanted to save it for that but now since you have asked i can say in simple that it can be achieved by using homologous methods where you have where you have um, uh, how can i put this so you have let's say this is the template hmm. let's say this is the template if you use a homologous template uh, i mean another temp, uh, another um, what can you call it a uh, homologous uh, gene uh, that you want to replace using homologous elements you can achieve a specific replacement of this region with another uh, you know sequence of your interest where you have absolute control does that make sense to you yes sir thank you it is homologous yeah. end joining methods yes yes thank you sir thank you yeah you welcome sir sure. yeah go ahead sir so, uh, like uh, in case of stem cells uh, gene editing one of the reasons uh -huh. for mosaic uh, one of the reason for mosaic editing can be epigenetic reprogramming right yes yes absolutely that i have not covered it here i want to cover it uh, in a dedicated another session uh which i'm thinking to fit epigenetics in uh i'm sure it was not mentioned in the module so here is what i'll be doing i'll be editing some themes to fit in epigenetics um this uh you know control in gene editing uh using different variants of crispr and let me go to the crispr slide so that it will be easy um to explain things what i intend yes here so i was saying that uh, here the epigenetic mechanism is very important to be appreciated like uh, you pointed out so um, we need to uh, you know uh, look for uh, ways where we can uh, keep epigenetic mechanisms in check so that is also very important that's true but okay, uh, did you have you a question associated did you have a question yeah. associated with epigenetic So or were you just pointing it out ha huh, so i was just asking we really like can it can it also be one of the reasons for mosaic editing yes, in yes. stem cells okay yes sir. yes that's very possible yes yeah so one thing to understand um, here is that this crispr although um, you know people knew about crispr's long back its application for gene editing came to be known 
mainly because of the discovery made by these people especially in this uh, past decade uh, especially uh, since uh, 2011 12 um, like uh, one of you were mentioning about zinc finger nucleases talens uh, i have personally used talens um, which are all very painful methods coming down to this simple me- method simple technique where you just have a guide rna that can target any gene of interest edit it by inducing mutations removing this gene that is faulty and replacing it with the correct gene such an application of crispr was shown by these people who showed basically that genes can be edited using this technique uh, so i'm basing this class uh, this uh, session mainly on, on like i said in the beginning to orient many of you who may or may not be on the same page on all these aspects and to have boot camps uh, like i um you know got you all involved in um to look at development of single cell to animal and then and then um looking at uh, you know um uh, basics in molecular biology with uh, you know dna replication transcription protein synthesis and then some uh touch and go on the dna editing and mainly the choice of cells that really influence um what the outcome of your experiment in gene editing is going to be so these were all that was covered in this session um you know we can have a thorough discussion uh for the next half an hour uh of this session uh you guys can feel free to uh talk about uh any of these aspects that we just discussed here i i will keep the slides in the slide show mode yeah do you guys want to um discuss about any of these aspects hello hello uh, yes sir yeah do you have any questions do you have any uh, points for discussion do you want me to go through the slides again so that it might help you uh i'm sorry you were not audible to me uh if if you are not audible can you please you can put your question in the chat box i think you are not audible at all so you are on mute uh you can enter your questions in the chat box i'll definitely attend to it if you are not sir? audible you could hello sir uh sir in one of in one of your slides uh, for germ cell uh, editing in the mm-hmm. diagram there was uh, mentioned p pgb so what is that germ cell editing okay like after micro injection step there was a uh, biopsy for pgb as a ha in this diagram so 
Okay. Where is it? Ah, uh, this PCD. That's a PGD. Blastomia biopsy for PGD. Ah, uh, it should be prostaglandin, I think. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. I need to. I I can get back to you about this. This must be uh, some test to uh, identify, uh, you know, the secretion of uh, uh, prostaglandin hormone. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Sir, regarding uh, the differentiation of uh, pluripotent or multipotent stem cell. Uh, uh huh. Induce, uh, uh, you know, uh, some uh, change. Yes, yes, CRISPR. yes, yes. So I yes. was just thinking, uh, is it possible to correct the defects associated with, say, blood cancer mm -hmm. if uh, a stem hematopoietic stem cell mm -hmm. is uh, corrected with, uh, you know, the, some of the effects which arrest the cell growth? Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible? And if you, if so, uh, what is the status like? You know, in is it being used or is it on the verge of? Uh... So most of the gene editing, uh, you know, therapy that is uh, being developed is just in preclinical or in um, you know mostly in the pre preclinical stages of development, uh, mostly in animal models. Preclinical pre would mean uh, mostly animal models and uh, all these uh, different, uh, you know, stem cell assays where they are uh, using animals as, uh, you know, models for uh, looking at the feasibility of such a therapy. So most of these techniques are in that stage. Uh, there are many companies who are pioneering these techniques so that they can apply these um, to patient cells, which can be um, used, like you said, to correct defects um, that originate um, not specifically from hematopoietic stem cells, even in um, you know uh, neuronal stem cells, for that matter. So yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we will we will uh, discuss about the applications of all these in a separate sessions thoroughly. Um, we will look at what's the status of uh, you know uh, these applications in terms of treatment, in what stage of uh, uh, trial each of these treatments to several different diseases. It could be any. We will cover all that in a separate session. So. Uh, yes. I have a question that is CRISPR research going on in India and like where it is really go going on, like in India. Uh -huh. Yeah, definitely it is going on. Um, uh, it, it, it is applied in several different aspects. Um, so most of the research in India is going on, um, you know, using CRISPRs, of course, in making animal models. Um, for uh, you know, for a disease, and then correct that disease using the same animal model using CRISPRs, of course, to uh, see if such um, if such a genetic change is feasible for correction. Uh, most of the research is uh, centered around this, and definitely there are places which are also looking at um, you know uh, using. Uh, different variations of these um, uh, you know, gene editing uh, techniques um, using whole animal, using uh, you know, uh, the germline or stem cell. Uh, all these different uh, gene editing uh, techniques are being used in many national institutes in India. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Sir, sure. we will use CRISPR Cas in case in case of plant. Yes, yes. You uh, can you repeat that question? I missed a bit of that question. I heard that you are referring to its use in the plants. Yes, sir. Can we use CRISPR Cas uh, gen genome editing in case of plants like salt tolerance, abiotic stresses? Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, why would you? 
think of uh, i mean it is definitely used in plants um, but uh, why are you specifically talking about such stress why would you want to use crispr cas9 in such stress uh, let me understand your question uh, do you mean to say that uh, you can improve the propagation Probably. of these plants uh, improve the propagation of these plants uh, uh using this technique by editing whatever genes that are involved in such uh, processes do you mean yes. that yes yes sir. yes yes it uh, so there is a lot of potential for crispr cas9 that is the reason why um, you know uh, why it is so widely appreciated and most of all it is very simple um, as simple as i described to you uh to design the experiment uh, where you look at the gene of interest uh, follow its genetic code design uh, the reagent uh, the guide rna and then apply it so it's very easy unlike other uh, you know uh, mutant making tool or gene editing tools uh, but uh, you know what needs to be kept in mind when you are using crispr cas9 is the topography of the dna sequence uh, the region in the chromosome that you are targeting so you have the chromosome and it is not this loose and this fancy as it is looking here these regions have secondary structures uh, tightly forming and these secondary structures interact closely locking certain regions from being accessed uh, by anything uh, foreign so you have to design your region of interest your region of interest rather be open and available easily for the editing process and the mechanism uh, you know to uh, to access it basically uh, if if your gene of interest let's say beat uh, uh, any stress tolerance or uh, anything for that matter in plants or animals uh, it is important to choose the region of interest wisely we will cover it in uh, the uh, crispr cas9 guide rna design designing session that we will probably have day after tomorrow okay sir thank you sir yeah, yeah. you welcome sir oh. in uh, mosaic editing like uh, it can either be uh, like some nucleotides are getting deleted some are getting added so so what is the exact reason for that like if we are if we are uh, using genetic gene editing tools and we either want to delete a gene or add a gene so why are such changes happening like why does mosaic editing exactly happen so mosaic editing happens for many reasons uh so okay let me go to that slide again okay um so okay rather let's go to the crispr cas9 slide itself or here yeah better here mm. so what's happening is let me use the pointer is the pointer okay so what happens is um okay there is no cas9 okay whatever uh, imagine what it says about dna cutting enzyme this um turbine that um uh, this uh, blade that um you know you use to cut this strand of dna uh, basically the cas9 that is uh, represented as a blade here uh, this has although this is guided by an rna to reach this target region although this enzyme is guided by this rna to reach its target region at the target region it doesn't have um any specificity 
for any particular nucleotide at any particular position. So it just randomly cuts three to four bases after what you call as PAM sequence. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I need the pointer. Okay, if I go to the pointer. Then here, yeah. All right, the pointer goes away. Okay, can you see the cursor moving around here? Hello, whoever asked this question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this pointer here, uh, this cursor here is pointing to uh, something tiny uh, and uh, represented in yellow here. This is called the PAM sequence. Okay, uh, protospacer Sorry, adjustment. Okay, um, how can I help you here? Let me, okay, this is better. <clears throat> here, can you see the pointer now moving around? Yes, yes. Sir. So, <clears throat> so this is the guide RNA carrying this Cas9 uh, endonuclease. This nuclease is brought to this target region where it has to make the cut. And this guide RNA only helps it to identify this region. This is like uh, looking at a landmark and finding your way into the place. But at this place, you don't know where exactly to cut. This Cas9 doesn't know where exactly to cut. What it does is it randomly cuts three to four bases upstream, upstream this, yellow region, which is called the protospacer adjacent motif. This region will have different nucleotides uh, at different target regions, but the protospacer adjacent motif is same in all the target regions. So this enzyme doesn't cut on this PAM, this protospacer adjacent motif, but neighboring sequences uh, upstream from it. And this is random cutting. It is not specific. So when you cut something randomly, and the idea here is that this random cut will repair by, will be repaired by the cell using its own uh, cellular mechanism. There are two of these, um, which we will talk tomorrow, but to introduce you to it, it's called non-homologous end joining, where it doesn't care what the homology is with the strands or a template strand is not required for stitching this DNA, this cut DNA back. And in doing so, there are errors here. There are errors in these sequences, in these nucleotides that are introduced. So this is how the CRISPR-Cas9 brings in mutations. Does that answer your question? Yes, I got it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so we are close to finishing. If anybody have a couple more questions, we can address them. Uh, of course, um, not everything can be covered in the same day. Um, and not everybody, everyone would uh, would be on the same page. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, might be advanced. Some of you might be intermediates, and some uh, are just uh, probably starting your, uh, um, you know, biology courses. So um, I believe we have a pool of, uh, you know, people from every level uh, in uh, expertise and speciality. So. In the beginning, it's important to understand and lay the foundation for basics. And I believe we achieved that today. Uh, if you have more questions, you can approach me. Um, we can spend some more time discussing. So, 
mosaic editing is a disadvantage of uh, somatic gene editing right um disadvantage or you know you are in a very preliminary stage there i would rather say that you know mosaic gene editing happens because you are in a very preliminary stage um it's a disadvantage specifically at this stage but if you screen if you screen for specific population uh, of cells or animals with uniform gene editing which is achievable you will get it but nonetheless it is important to appreciate that mosaic gene editing is present uh it's uh, a problem if uh you know if if you rely on cells that are in this stage that is why it is important to appreciate that this stage where you successfully see gene editing um how can i better show this okay we will um cover mosaic editing in detail tomorrow uh, that would uh, probably help because there have been a lot of uh, questions about mosaic gene editing i think i'll uh, make a detailed slide for uh, tomorrow's session uh, where we can address it but to answer your question in short uh, it's a problem if you rely on this stage um, where you have a population a mixed population of cells which have different um, you know uh, edits happening but uh, if you narrow it down and screen and narrow it down to uniform cell populations or animals with uniform uh, gene editing it will not be a problem definitely okay thank you sir and yeah. so this cannot be a part of germline editing right this this technique that's a very good question uh, i would like to address this right away so you have you have uh, an issue of mosaic editing even in germline editing because uh, you are exposing your cells your cells here okay imagine this itself as the germline so you have introduced okay let's um, how do we do this which is the ideal slide here okay go back to cells okay here yeah so pointer yep so here you have introduced your gene editing tools by injecting into this um uh, uh you know egg or egg or sperm or uh, the fertilized um uh, you know uh egg uh where you have zygotes and since you have just freshly introduced these uh reagents for gene editing they might still be active in this one cell stage or in this zygotic stage where there are two cells here uh these gene editing tools will still be active and might still be editing genes in these two different cells at the same time and when that happens when the gene editing happens here and here simultaneously the changes will be different in cell 1 and cell 2 and these cells when cell 1 and cell 2 divide into further uh, population of cells they all will probably have the same gene editing tool active for some more time which will keep editing their genes unless there is a conditional stop on the gene editing tool but nonetheless you don't have control uh, on this gene editing tool for a while where it is free to edit the genes in cells as they are dividing and if the editing keeps happening as the cells are still dividing you will have mosaic pattern that is the main basis for mosaic pattern um to address your question in short yes even germline uh, gene editing is prone to mosaicism is that clear thank you sir okay 
um, I think we, uh, do you have any more questions? We have some more time to spend no, on sir. this session. Okay, all right. Uh, it's good. I really enjoyed this um, talking to you guys. It's uh, it 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 was fun addressing your questions, and um, yeah, hope uh, the session was uh, uh, you know uh, clear to you. Um, hope you didn't have any audio issues. Um, of course, there were a couple of audio issues at my end, but uh, if I missed something or if you uh, have missed something in this class and if you want to, uh, you know, uh, carry forward your questions, you can, uh, you can save it for tomorrow. Uh, hopefully you're taking notes and uh, with the notes, you can have your questions. You can still ask me again tomorrow on these concepts. Sir, are you going to provide us with any notes or do you need to take Hello? the notes? Hello? Yes? Sir, I'm asking, are you by any chance going to provide us with any notes? Um, notes, uh, I, I can provide these slides. These okay. Them. Okay, sir. These would themselves serve as notes. Okay. Uh, that's not an issue. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Sir. I will speak to the organizers how we can do this effectively. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Um, if uh, there are no more questions, we could probably end this session. Sir, thank you very much for this very informative and inter uh, interactive sessions. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, from Thakur College, Dr. Aparna Deshno, Coordinator oh, of you. Biotechnology. I also enjoyed your session. And what I liked more was students were very open and they were asking a lot of questions. Which we generally yeah, that's very encouraging for me as well. We generally yeah. don't find so many questions being asked in our regular lectures. So students are interested. Yeah. And credit goes to you, sir. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Thank Out you. of curiosity, are you from uh, talking from TIFR campus? Uh, I I do work here uh, yeah. at NCBS. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for your session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You're all welcome. Thank you.